Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and I'm here with Pipe Swing and Michael Kester. That's right. And uh, we have we have a special show today. Yeah, today we're doing one of those. Our, yeah, our David Cronenberg uh, special episode of David Cronenberg. Um, uh, this is one of the few times we've done this. The first time we did this was with Darren, Darren Aronofsky. Aronofsky, right? And we did it as kind of a primer to later talk about. Because we had Requiem for a Dream coming up, and there was enough to talk about in that show that we didn't want to talk about all of the Aronofsky stuff. So we did an episode early where we talked about Pie in the Fountain. Uh, what movies are we doing today? Talking about Mr. Cronenberg. Today we're going to do Scanners, which is one of the early 80s sci-fi bloody weird shit. <laughs> yes. And then we're going to do Eastern Promises, which is one of the newer Your Mom Likes This Film films. Yeah, yeah the modern one. I don't know if Your Mom Likes This well, Film. Well, Your Mom thinks she does. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's one of the more modern ones. Uh, this will be great. You can help me with this because I get the 80s stuff. I don't get the modern ones as much. So I think you have a really good handle on this. Yeah, I think it's the opposite for me, actually. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about The Fly way later in this show, a million episodes from now. Uh, but The Fly does a lot of stuff that's kind of separate from Cronenberg. Like puts and, Jeff Goldblum in it. Yeah, right. And The Fly itself is a remake. So I, there's just a lot going on there. So today we'll just focus on the Cronenberg stuff. And God damn it, are there spoilers? Yeah. Uh, Cronenberg has some really interesting scripts, some really bizarre stuff. So knowing anything about his films are going to spoil him. But I think there's plot heavy spoilers. Sure. Well, the thing about David Cronenberg is that you kind of get introduced, to, at least with these two films, you're immediately immersed in the world of the film. Yeah. And unfortunately, the entirety of the film is spent figuring out what kind of world you're sure. in. And then the instant you find that out is when you find your conclusion. Yeah. The movie is over. At that so point. essentially, we're I gonna, guess we see that with both films. Yeah. We're going to spoil the film. Just by talking about it. Right. And if you uh, if you hear our discussion before you go back and, and watch the films, that's going to ruin a big part of the film. That's right. Uh, especially with Eastern Promises. Yeah. You know, Cronenberg mentioned that in a lot of interviews he did. He doesn't want anyone to write anything about the plot of the movie uh, outside of the bare DVD jacket kind of stuff. So a lot of heavy plot twists in that one, especially. If you've only seen one of the movies, we have chapters mm -hmm. inside the show. So you can use those to skip to the particular movie you've seen. Uh, we're going to do a little bit just about Cronenberg in the beginning. That's not specific right. to either film. So if you don't care about David Cronenberg but just really like one of these movies, then you can skip directly to that movie, or you could skip to the end of the show and see what the fuck we're doing next time. All right, I got a packed intro about Cronenberg. Okay, so cool. before I do that thing where I just ramble off for yeah. a long time, why don't you give me your your quick take of the Cronenberg you've seen? All right, so I, I can I can say the ones that I haven't seen. I think that's a good place to start. Okay, right. I haven't seen Crash, mm -hmm. I haven't seen Naked Lunch, and I haven't seen A History of Violence. Yeah, those are the big ones. Those are the ones off the top sure. of my head that I know I haven't seen. But I've seen the other big ones that you're probably... Video Drone, Scanners, right, right. Eastern Promises, The Fly. I mean, sure. the ones... A lot the, of the heavy hitters. Sure, so... From what I understand, oh, The Brood, another one I've seen. Yeah, we'll be talking about that on the Music Box show right. uh, in a few weeks. So what I understand is that in the 80s, David Cronenberg was either on a lot of drugs or doing a <laughs> lot of very strange sci-fi stuff. Yeah. I mean, Videodrome is the perfect example of what the fuck is going on in this sure, man's head. Sure, sure. And for some reason, at some point, he kind of refines to do these more... It You know what it is? It's the same film but it's done in a more adult disguise. Mm -hmm. It's still just as fucked up. It's still just as deep. It's still just as heavy, but it's done with less heads exploding with less right. guns coming out of your stomach yeah. and a lot more Betamax. Well, it's the newer stuff is done with, uh, it's taking the surreal parts of real life. Oh, sorry. You meant the newer stuff, yeah. not versus yeah. Videodrome because right. Videodrome is just Betamax. Right. It's, it's done taking the surreal parts of real life and kind of, kind of, I guess, examining them as yeah. the strangeness of mankind, which he's kind of always been doing. Right. Whereas the, uh, whereas the older stuff, the 80s stuff, and I, the stuff, you know, the newer the film gets, the more, um, I don't necessarily want to say mainstream or even normal, but I mean, in, in Eastern Promises, we're talking about mobsters. Sure. 
And there's uh, there's some strange stuff going on in there, but mobsters are a very real component of real life. In the 80s, we were talking about psychopharmaceuticals, um, the kind of stuff you're dealing with in 70s the brood. 70s too. The I think the brood came out in 78. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the work even before that was extremely sexual and very bizarre in nature as well. So I think it's gotten a little less strange over time, but definitely not any less interesting. The treatment is right. the same, although For the sure. subject matter is a little bit different. Yeah, and it's really interesting to watch it mature. I think he's one of the one of the few directors that each film you actually you kind of mature with him because he started when he was a younger guy and, yeah. and younger filmmakers are always hot shots trying to do weird stuff. Yeah. Strive to go in a, a very uh, and, extreme direction. I and guess. I want to make sure right now that we point out that we're not going to say Eastern promises is David Cronenberg abandoning his style. No, not at I think all. it's, I think it's a refined version of the same style he's been For doing sure. since day one. So this isn't the first time we've seen Cronenberg on the show. No, no, it isn't. That's usually my line, right? But uh, Jason 10, Jason X, is where we first saw Cronenberg, I think. Although he does some weird acting stuff, so he may have snuck into other movies. But Jason X was our first Killapalooza. That's pretty early on in the entirety of the show, so it's highly probable. So that's fair to say. So he's the scientist that's kind of (laughs) coming to view Jason in the beginning of that film. Yeah, yeah. we talked about that back in the episode, too. I think we did spot him uh, when we saw that. Spot the Cronenberg. So the early stuff is part of a pretty specific genre uh, of other stuff we've covered, um, of this sort of body horror is what most people call it. I like to think of it as organic horror, although... Bio-horror. Yeah, bio-horror kind of stuff, where it's extremely rooted in biology. Um, stuff we've seen on the show when we talked about The Thing, when we talked about uh, even Alien, you know, the the way sure. that the, the face huggers, right. uh, the alien lives inside you. There's some biological elements to that reanimator of course you know that's going up real soon uh along with the brood we'll talk about the fly um videodrome is another one that covers that even all the way back to cabin fever things that deal maybe not even specifically with disease that's certainly a component of it but where you're afraid of the disease itself and uh the disease cropping up in other people sure so the disease is not only scary as an element what if i get the disease but who else has the disease right. it's who has that infection and who's dangerous as a result it's, of that it's a really interesting line to walk because it's not zombies no it's not this disease could spread and everybody becomes mindless right, blah blah right. blah boring seen this a thousand times the disease is kind of a character it's, yeah. it's kind of a an aspect to the to the film that brings in its own interesting points depending on which film we're talking about. Well, and what's specifically horrifying about it is the damage, the uh, kind of twisting or perversion of the body. You know, there's always a point in these movies where one of the characters gets the disease and slowly turns. And in the Cronenberg movies, you always see the deterioration Mm -hmm. of the body. It's always pieces falling off or boils showing up. Well, it's kind of like, I mean, in a, in a, exaggerated sense it's like the early parts of uh dead alive i don't know if you remember yeah, right, that but right. parts where ears are falling into yeah. custard and stuff yeah, like yeah, that yeah. <laughs> yeah something like that so i guess it's just as much that transformation a lot of people working in that genre will use uh look at cabin fever use the disease as an antagonist but with cronenberg's stuff you usually see those events as a catalyst we'll talk about that a lot with the fly but that kind of um body stuff is it's what motivates the characters into doing something. The one other thing I wanted to mention about Cronenberg before we do get into scanners, uh, not that he's Canadian or not that he's an atheist, although both very hip. I wanted to mention that his his work is often extremely sexual and focuses on fetishes and kinks. Uh, you see that in Crash. You see that even a little in The Brood with mm-hmm. the kid stuff going something on there about that um but <laughs> there's something sexual yeah in there. there's something weird and sexual going on in there but we don't see that i don't think really in either of today's no features. i guess we've so, failed well we get all of the big cronenberg stuff from the old and the new but just not hitting up the the sexuality that's prevalent specifically in his earlier work well maybe we'll get to that on the fly a little bit yeah you know what else you do get that a little in history of violence now that i think about it that's part of the awkwardness of that too but uh, you know that's part of the later stuff when it, the tension is more about you know how he's getting under your skin uh metaphorically i guess instead of physically mm-hmm. like the old stuff so we'll start with scanners and scanners is probably the least sexual thing that he's done at this point 
although it's really well remembered for being so fucking odd. Yeah. Um, along with something like the brood, this is rooted in psychopharmacology. It's, um, you know, it's part of why I never, there's a, there's a weird thing in watching the double feature today. I have a hard time trusting uh, Patrick McGuhan's character, mm-hmm. Dr. Paul Ruth, for no reason. Because he's old? I mean, there's no, yeah, I have a distrust of old people, apparently. Is there any reason not to trust this guy? Uh, he, you know, I think it's because he knows too much. And you find out later on that he's kind of been lying the whole time. Yeah, You yeah. find out he's the father. You find out he's been fostering the scanners sure. from the beginning. Sure. So I guess he's a distrustful guy, but at the same time, he's not a bad guy. Right. So we get that medical theme and that kind of psycho, uh, I guess it's psychopharmacology. That's what it is. That theme is there. And you see that in some of uh, Cronenberg's other stuff. But there's also this theme we didn't talk about yet of the underground, of this movement or this experiment that's kind of kept secret. Uh, the Brood had one of those. Crash was, you know, an underground of people who had a sexual fetish for car crashes. Right. Um, David Cronenberg's Crash, obviously not the other Crash, which is so not about sexual car fetishes. Not too much. Not it's, even a little bit. It's everybody's latent racism. That's the villain in that film. So you mentioned it earlier. One of my favorite things about uh, almost all of Cronenberg's stuff is you jump right into the world. You are right into things, moving right along with the plot before you have any idea why that's happening. It's um, it's not until, again, as you said, till the end of the film where you've put all the pieces together. You just know that all of the characters are running towards a point. Sure. You're dropped in. You see a bunch of people running, and you just start running after them. And you don't necessarily know where they're running or why they're running. You have an idea of the place they're running, but not what they hope to accomplish when they get there. And you continue to run after them. It always kind of keeps you guessing and keeps you paying attention, right. really. It keeps you looking to, to figure out the information before you run by it. Sure, and that's a really smart technique as well, because while you're sitting there trying to you know grasp at any clue of information, mm-hmm. it's a really good way to get around... Are, I guess this is this one of this year's most biggest pet peeves, I guess, on double feature. Mm-hmm. But it's a really good way of getting around deus ex machina. Yeah. If you don't explain the rules, then you don't have to defy <laughs> them later. Right. You just yeah. you just get to drop new things in and people pick it up going, yes, information, information. Yeah, I need right. to know about this world. And you don't get a chance to go, hey, wait a second. You said this and now there's a book that tells me that right. all this other stuff happens. Well, absolutely. Look at the scanning mechanism. Right. The titular scanners, that's what we're talking about in the movie. That's what drives the plot, is these abilities people have. All we know is that people have abilities. That's all the movie gives us, and it basically has an out that these abilities can expand as far as they want to, and that just increases uh, the stakes of the story. It doesn't seem like they're inventing powers. It's just, wow, these people were even more powerful than I knew. Sure, right. You start off and you know it's telepathy, but you don't know how or why that works. Or to what just extent. Know, well, or to what extent. But, I mean, it, it expands from telepathy, and then it goes into telekinesis. Eventually, it goes into pyrokinesis. By the end of the movie, we're manipulating people's thoughts. We're making people see their own mother. We're grafting, um, compu- we're grafting our <laughs> yeah. nervous system to the yeah. nervous system of uh, Microsoft DOS. Yeah, even hacking into the computer's nervous system. I know enough about computers to know they don't have nervous systems, but it's the 80s, so no one else knew that. Yeah, that, right. That was knowledge that people didn't have, so you could get away with that. And those are all things we buy just because we're catching up with the movie, and we feel like the movie, it's telling us first. It, we're not finding this out third hand, like when the movie drops an imaginary book, and then we read the book and find out there's new rules. This is a movie where as soon as the characters find out, we find out. We see it first. So we feel like we're there when it happens, and that's why we don't feel cheated. We can still get new things and have that fresh discovery without feeling cheated. Right. I think it's totally coincidental, but I know they actually started filming this before the script was written. Uh, So I don't think David Cronenberg was making up powers as he went along day-to-day on shooting. But I do know that he would end up writing this movie at 3 or 4 in the morning before they started shooting for the day. So uh, they would try and run out and scramble and find different sets, different locations to shoot. And he's always said that Scanners was a huge fucking nightmare as a result of that. When we go back to, you know, to stay on this power stuff, we go back to what really caused the powers in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get into the uh, pharmacology, where we get into all the medicine stuff. Right. And where this starts to venture into disease territory. Sure. 
because we haven't really talked about, you know, I mean, these are mind beams at this point. People are doing things with their mind. It has nothing to do with disease, although it starts manifesting itself right. that way. That's how you start seeing it in the characters. Uh, Michael Ironside's character, for instance, has a weird circle on his head that well, just won't leave. It's because he drilled a hole in his head trying to, I guess, what, reopen his third eye? Yeah, right. It it has to. Uh, <laughs> the look you just gave me was fucking priceless. <sighs> I wish people could see it. He's prying open his third eye. So, of course, that has to uh, that has to leave the mind and somehow manifest itself physically in the brain. And that means putting a drill in your temple, apparently. Do what you got to do, man. Scan or be scanned. But the root of all this comes from this drug. What do they call the drug in the movie? Ephemeral. Ephemeral is what it is. Uh, but, you know, we talked about that in our year end very briefly because we didn't know what the fuck we were talking about. And we still don't really know what yep. the fuck we were talking no about. No idea. But in the 50s, there was that drug that was ad, uh, administered as a sedative to pregnant women. The um, Rosemary's Baby drug. I think it was called thalidomide. Uh, I could be wrong because I wasn't even a thought in the 50s. I was nowhere near pregnant women or babies or sedatives at that point. So I have no knowledge about any of that stuff. But it caused birth defects, and it was part of uh, the horror zeitgeist, if you will. Uh, see how I've just given into zeitgeist at this point? It's a great just, word. It's, I hate saying it, but there's just, otherwise I have to go on for three paragraphs exactly. trying to get around zeitgeist. That's why it's a great so word. I just want to let everyone know at this point I've given up and we'll it's just start saying, saying zeitgeist on this show. That's what everybody was afraid of at the time because it was fucking things up. And the parallels, they don't start out very clear here. I knew going into scanners this time that uh, that's kind of a reference being made to that drug. At first, you just see people administering the drug. You're wondering what's going on there. But as soon as you start giving it to pregnant women, mm -hmm. then you go, oh, yes. That, With scanny that babies. wonderful thing. For, yeah, right. When the, when the fetus scans right. the woman from the um, hospital lobby. Yeah. So the most iconic scene that fandom really likes from scanners is the scene where Michael Ironside comes down as a volunteer to be scanned, and he's some innocent college youth ready to right. understand more about the world of scanners. His character, of course, I believe is the hero throughout the movie. Right. For some reason, I can't let that go either. And in doing so, he absolutely intentionally and 100% with evil ideals blows up the head of other scanner man. Well, it's part of the resistance. You have to blow up the head. I mean, that's just what the resistance does. It's an absolutely vicious scene. And if you've never seen the film, if, if you're like me and you didn't know that's the thing about scanners, right. it is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's – well, all right. You have this moment. Um, you know, I'll get to that in a second. But let's just talk about this scene before I wander too far away from it. So this is something that if you haven't seen scanners and you don't listen to us and whatever – then go on YouTube and just look up, I don't know. Type scanners. Scanners. Head. Type scanners. Yeah, that'll probably be fine. Or scanners head explosion or something. And uh, you will see this scene. And it's so typical of Cronenberg stuff. It's just the ultimate pile of gore, this weird body stuff that you see all throughout his 80s shit. It's a prosthetic head, obviously. No one has any question about that. Mm -hmm. But what they did to get these, this pile of gore is they filled it with livers, and then they shot it from behind with a shotgun. Wow. And that's how they got it to explode. And they just uh, filmed it at, a, I expect, a higher frame rate so they could slow it down and get this glorious head explosion that's still sampled and used uh everywhere, even today, because nothing like it has ever been created. It's I don't insane. think I could have possibly come up with a more practical way to yeah, go about right? that. It's just, oh, why don't Shoot we just... Shoot a bunch of livers with a shotgun. <laughs> yeah, right. Why don't we just get a balloon and draw a face on it, fill it with some, some chicken parts, and just shoot it with a gun? The shorthand I just made up for that is even more complicated mm -hmm. than what they actually did. So the most iconic scene for me is the scene... So when we were talking about doing scanners on the show, mm -hmm. this was way earlier on in the year when we were kind of developing the schedule. Yeah. But I, I guess I, and, and you were almost offended, and so I, I've immediately stepped back from saying so. That's what you got to do. But I said, so are you, like, laughing at Scanners, or are you totally serious about <laughs> right. it? And you're like, I'm totally serious. You got Scanners serious. is a serious film. And is I, there a hint of irony to anything I enjoy anymore? I mean, really? Anything? <laughs> so I, I was, I was, first time I saw Scanners, I was like, this is pretty cool. I really enjoy it. This is a fun ride. Yeah, right. 
But the scene that I think is is I almost started laughing when we were watching it earlier, uh-huh. but I didn't want to because I was afraid I was going to get dagger was, eyes from yeah, my right. co-host. Stop right. ruining the seriousness <laughs> right. of my Cronenberg. Right. But the scene where he's okay. So maybe if I describe it to you, you'll start laughing. <laughs> I'm already laughing. The scene where Cameron Vale is in an art studio. And within the art studio, he's in a giant head. Right. And he starts beating up four other scanners by swinging his head around like he's a dancing chick from the Mind 80s. beams. He's moving around like Paula Abdul inside a giant head, and they don't know he's there. And they're just flying around the room. Opposites and attract, man. Apparently them flying into piles of soft garbage is enough to incapacitate them. That scene made me laugh, and I'm I'm not I'm not knocking the film. I love the scene, and I think it's very well done. But come on, it's a little funny. Oh, I'm getting exactly what you say. Here's a, if you want to laugh at scanners, this is what makes it easy. Watch the film on mute. Yeah, because exactly. it's just people making squinty, funny faces at each other and bending their heads. Until someone just explodes. Yeah. And not That's, to say that that doesn't work. No, it works It's a beautifully. fantastic technique yeah. for the film, yeah. but at the same time, funny faces and heads right. blowing up. I right, mean, come right. on, that's a if fun you time. Can, if you can uh, take yourself out of the moment for even a second and then come back and look in objectively, it is ridiculous. And not in the way I usually use ridiculous on the show where I mean awesome. I mean, it is actually ridiculous. All right, but I keep saying mind beams. We talked about mind beams being... I think in Dark City was probably mm-hmm. the last time we brought it up. We don't do a lot of films where people are shooting mind lasers at each other because that's just stupid. But uh, I don't think you will ever get better mind beams than in Scanners. Absolutely not. The first reason is the, the reason we just uh, talked about. But the second is, I mean, when you have a mind beam, and Scanners almost kind of uh, fucks itself over with this, when you have that shot we described where you uh, have a mind beam that makes a man's head explode, it's really hard to top that. Yep. I mean, the film almost never comes close. I think the final battle actually does manage to do some more pretty fucked up stuff. Yeah. Different fucked up. Maybe not better or worse fucked up, but different fucked up. Um, all other mind beams in all other movies just completely fail, unless someone's head is going to explode. Unless you think you can do it better than Scanners. Which you can. Don't even try. Yeah, it's just always a letdown. But I love it because it's so cheap. There's no actual beams like we see in Dark City. It's just people cocking their head and looking awkward. Mm -hmm. And then lots of sound. Walls of a grating, intense sound that makes you think that there's some kind of transference of energy or telepathy or something going on. Sometimes they'll also show the connection uh, between the two minds by crossfading the shots of one person's face over another person's face where they line up the eyes. Um, Just all these little, clever, low-budget kind of things to uh, make you understand the powers of the world without once ever tracing in permanent marker uh, a line from one person's head to another. Just to go back to the first one, this is some of the most tension I've ever experienced in a film. You know during the scans, especially before you know what the scans are, And it's a good idea that they put the head explosion so early on so you know how bad they can become. But when you have uh, a scene like this where you know something's coming and a character, they start vibrating and they start breathing frantically and the music starts elevating, which, by the way, try this on people. I encourage our entire audience to go out and stare at someone and then force yourself into convulsions. You will freak the person the fuck out. But what helps it a little bit more in the movie is all of this sound. You know, the film often couples these scenes with an increasing pitch in the score. The pitch will just keep going up and Mm -hmm. up until you think it can't get any higher. And then if there's some kind of beat associated with that at all, the pace will increase. The heartbeat scene, uh, for instance. You know, you have the usual whirring machines, those distorted keyboard sounds that you always get. But you also have the heartbeat pitch going up. And the man's heartbeat increasing until you think, well, maybe his heart will actually explode out of his chest. It's just really fucking tense when nothing's actually going on in the frame except people making stupid faces at each other. Even when they're not shooting mind beams, I mean, there's a pretty heavy, it's a heavy audio film. Uh, You know, the, the voices, when you can hear the other people's voices... Those are always mixed together with some kind of flange, or what is that? I guess that's like a chorus effect they're using on a lot of those. It's some modulation. And then there's pitch shifting going uh, throughout those just to make the thoughts harder to hear. 
rather than obscure the audio through, uh, let's say, volume in the film and make it hard to hear, you're aware that the characters are hearing audio, but they've lowered the pitch so much that to the viewer, it's not really, uh, right. it's not understandable. Okay, so at the end of Scanners, we get the twist. This is the thing that you could never possibly see coming, and it's the moment where you go, oh my god, I understand, and the movie yeah. ends. Yeah. You find out that Cameron and Revic are brothers. And not spiritual brothers or metaphorical right. brothers, but literally brothers. And furthermore, that Ruth is their father. You find out that the three characters you've been following the whole time are a big happy family. Yeah. And so there's this, a mind meld, if, if we can reach to Star Trek. Yeah, sure, mind meld, that's fine. And Revik has decided he's going to suck Cameron into inside of him. Right. And they're going to essentially join and become one. Yeah. Because Cameron refuses to actually join Revik in his, his mission to create a bunch of super babies. Would you say they're going to form a weird amalgam? You know what I wouldn't do is say that. But what I will say is that the scene is great because you watch the veins form, yeah. pop, and yeah. squirt. Yeah. And that's not the only thing that pops. Eventually, poor Cameron, the man with the eyes, loses them. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, there's the heart burst in there at right. some point, too, or some kind of weird chest burst. Uh, and then his eyes melt. I mean, I think his eyes melting is probably as fucked up and on it. If they just blew up another head, you've already seen that. That mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Well, his eyes melt out of his fucking sockets. And that also helps because you go back to Michael Ironside's character and you see, you know, the thing with his wide eyes, right. which also looks extremely fucked up. But then you have just in your head, the transference of mm -hmm. the eyes kind of being the transference of that consciousness, right. him moving into the other body, mm -hmm. which is solidified when Kim walks back in the room and she sees the melted body on the floor. Uh, you cut back to Michael Ironside and you get the last line in the yeah. film and everything. And so that's the moment where you understand all of it and then credits roll. Right. Eastern Promises, on the other hand, far away from the 80s stuff, is uh, one of his most recent films. It is his and, most recent film. Yeah, I, I know he's working on a lot of stuff now. But he's the kind of guy I would not be surprised if between the hours that we've recorded this that's and true. put it up, another film it has just, just happened. reappeared. With the uh, retired Viggo Mortensen, by the way, yeah. just showing up in the film. That bastard lied to us. So the modern stuff I understand a little bit less. But of uh, between, if we're just going to look at the last two and say um, A History of Violence and Eastern Promises, I understand Eastern Promises more. Uh -huh. Only because I've painstakingly drugged myself through other crime films. Yeah. And I will tell everyone now who has even a, a slightest bit of interest in, oh, the crime drama, that's kind of, maybe you saw this movie. Sure. And you said, wow, crime films, there really is something to that. Maybe I'll go check out Goodfellas and Godfather and Casino and all that shit. This is the best crime drama. <laughs> I mean, of all of the, the mafia, gangster, mob shit, I mean, I don't think it gets any better than Eastern Promises. And that is all, I mean, a lot of it's writing, mm -hmm. of course, too, uh, credit where credit's due. But it's the usual projects we see Cronenberg attach himself to. Sure. Even if he doesn't write a lot of his projects, he picks the projects that lend themselves best to his style. And his style is apparently awesome filmmaking. Absolutely. So this is not only a good crime film, but an excellent mystery. Yes. So maybe part of the problem with crime film is that crime films on their own, boring, snow. It's like Dexter, right? Sure. CSI on its own, boring, nobody cares, add a serial killer plot, and suddenly you have right. award-winning television. Well, I wouldn't even say that Eastern Promises knows it's a mystery. I no. think we're, I think we're, form we're following the Cronenberg formula, yeah. where we're just submerged into the story. Sure. And it's not that the, the film itself doesn't know it's a mystery. All the characters are aware of everything that they need to be aware of, with the exception of what? The people who aren't involved with the mob don't know what the mob's up right. to, and the mob doesn't know that they have a rat. And that's something that, it's not a mystery, it's something that the characters that we're immediately introduced to just simply wouldn't be talking sure. about. Not all people in real life are completely omnipotent, that's redundant I think, at all times. They don't know all the facts about every situation they walk into. Right. So it's only natural that when we're dropped into a film, first of all, the characters still have things to figure out doesn't necessarily make it. I think the only one who's solving a mystery here is Anna. Everybody sure. else, which Anna, by the way, has got to be one of the purest, just most selfless characters that we've talked about on the show. Yeah. Here is somebody who's already a nurse or a doctor or whatever, but then dedicating herself to uh, the memory of a woman who's now dead and a fucking baby. 
and all of this trouble she gets herself into, none of it is going to benefit her. At the very end of the movie, spoilers right now, they're happening. At the very end of the movie, all she gets out of the situation is a fucking baby that she has mm-hmm. to take care of. It's like after all of this work, after risking her life and the, the lives of uh, her family members, that's what she gets. But she's the one solving the mystery. She wants to know what's going on in this diary. All of the other characters moving at their normal pace, doing their normal day-to-day operations. It's just that when we're dropped in the movie, as is naturally expected, and something we don't hit on nearly enough in this show, that's what's realistic. You don't walk into a diner and hear a bunch of people talking about who they are as characters. Yeah, they don't all start from the beginning. They start from what they're doing right fucking then. And that's where we start from in this movie and a lot of Cronenberg movies. And I'm of the opinion that unless you're telling some sort of legendary narrative, that's probably where you should start because that's the natural place. So you have this diary. I mean, first, you don't even know what's in the diary. That's what starts the whole movie. You have uh, this diary that's found in this card, and that kind of leads you down the path. And eventually, you find out that this diary is, the, the content of it is so bad that the characters who have read it will not even tell you what mm-hmm. is in the diary. So now you're really, really curious about what's going on in here. The plot is still moving forward. You're still seeing all these people progress, especially on the mafia side, right. because they have no mystery to solve. They're just doing what they're doing, and you're still trying to catch up. You know that you are after what's in this diary. You don't even know what's in the diary, but you know you're after that. Right. And from there, you have these conflicting interpretations, and this is where the movie really starts to pique my interest, because there's two people who are willing to interpret this. This is uh, Anna's uncle on one side here, and then Simeon on the other, uh, Simeon, right? Yeah, Simeon. I guess. Yeah. That's Russian, apparently. Russian. My Russian is terrible. As bad as my Italian, apparently. actually. And both of them seem like general, uh, to be honest with you, the uncle kind of seems like a dick. Yeah. He's a racist and he, he makes, well, he doesn't make jokes, but he says some things about her baby, uh, how she lost her baby. He says her baby of, died because she didn't fuck a Russian guy. Yeah, right. Or an Englishman. I don't know. Because, because there was some mixed ancestry in the race oh, of such the an baby. awful thing for him to say. And he's the one who's going to interpret the, the diary, right? So unlike the doctor of the previous film, uh, Simeon is someone I should actually be suspicious of. Right. But because he's such a happy, rocking guy, I just, I'm totally fine with everything that's happening. Now, you think that this archetype of the disgruntled mob boss really needs yeah. to fade into the past. I don't understand why the the mob mafia don, the mob boss, is always such a pissed off, cranky motherfucker. <laughs> right. Okay, so imagine you are running the mob. Uh-huh. You are the leader. One, you are safe. You are so fucking safe. Right. The only people that whack the don are people that you see coming a mile away. Yeah. And you kind of have to do the, what, the Godfather thing where you kind of cross your arms and go, yep, going to die. Yeah. Then the second thing, you are loaded. You are fucking made right, financially right. because all the illegal operations that you're doing, every single bit of it comes back to you and you decide who it goes to. And when you're deciding who it goes to, they're all your buddies. Right. Nobody gets in without your say-so. Right. You are surrounded by people you like. You are safe as all fucking hell, and you're loaded. Well, and look at the lifestyle of this guy. He sits around in this restaurant where he conducts business, drinks fine wine, sure. and eats all the time, well, and has birthday parties he gets, for children. He gets to have a restaurant, and he's yeah. not, he doesn't have a restaurant to make ends meet. He has a restaurant right. because he, maybe he fucking wanted to own a restaurant. Right. Because he can do what he wants. I'm not going to be as forward as to say mob bosses have no problems, but I think by the time this movie's made, you know, 2007 or whatever, that is such a cliche. I mean, after The Sopranos, I think we're done with that. You had all the movies I mentioned. You had the Godfather shit and the Goodfellas stuff. I mean, you have all of these tortured poor mobsters with all of the stuff they have to manage. You know, they're managers. And oh, boohoo, they have a lot to do. And that was all of The Sopranos. It was Tony Soprano has to take therapy because he has so many problems. So here we just see a happy, jovial guy, and that also happens to throw us off his character a little bit, which is what we need. Mm -hmm. So eventually we do realize that he's the suspicious one with something else to gain right about the time that Anna does. We're following her right uh, Right. right along there. But then we also have this wild card, which it's not a wild card because it's so close to the at the forefront of the film, but it's Viggo Mortensen's Mm -hmm. character who we find out at the end of the movie, fucking spoilers, fuck you, go back and watch the movie right goddamn now. 
uh, who we find out at the movie at the end of the movie is an agent yeah. of an undercover agent of I guess what's replaced the KGB essentially. Sure. So uh, all of his actions, and we don't find that out till the very end. So we can go back and look at a lot of his actions and kind of uh, view them under that lens and say, all right, that informs a lot of why mm-hmm. his character did those things sure. at those moments. I think they do a really good job of throwing us off that path because there's also an alternate reason why each of these things had, you know, his loyalties question in the beginning, you know, when they're at the brothel or whatever. Sure. And uh, the other character, Kirill, yeah. I'm going to call him Kirill in my butchered American accent is telling him that he demands that he sleep with one of these bitches and he wants to watch. And so instead of saying the thing that would make you think, what if if he is an agent? Instead of going, I need you to know that you are committed to this operation and not a cop, so bang one of these prostitutes. He says, I need to know that you are committed to this operation and not gay. Right. So so I am now, which that's also funny too. So I am now going to watch you right. bang one of these prostitutes. Well, there's this whole underlying thing the whole time about Kirill's character mm-hmm. where he may or may not be gay. It almost matters. It right. almost falls into the scope of the film. Yeah. At the end, I think. The film kind of ends before that story ever gets risen yeah but he goes behind his father's back to kill people who are saying he's gay right he watches nikolai fuck a chick yeah i mean it doesn't seem to be the oppressing matter in comparison to everything else eventually it comes into play in the in the question of the very last frame of the film where you go where's kareel yeah but uh, you know but other than that it's it's an afterthought you know oh yeah he was a queer so they probably didn't like him so much (laughs) yeah in that same scene, uh, you see him give the prostitute money. I mean, he's trying to help her out. And that just seems at that point like he's a nice mobster. Like he's someone who's a little bit hesitant to to dive headfirst into this business. And that's all of his interactions with Anna, too. Maybe he's a little sweet on her. He's giving her rides to different places and whatever. Okay, so he's a nice mobster. The other thing they do is you eventually learn that he's new to this job. So that's another point where he would be suspect as maybe this guy's an agent. Right. It's the scene where they're um where they're unloading the wine. He first mm-hmm. gets the the giant truck of wine and they're talking about he's new and maybe Kirill will show him how things are done. Maybe it's time to finally Import, let him in on some of this. Yeah, on the bigger parts of the business. You know, he's gained that trust. I think that's a really clever scene uh or just I guess the whole treatment of that character because the first impression you get is that he's been doing this a long time. And you get that impression because Kirill is a fuck up right. because the guy is wasted and he has to carry him home because the guy, you know, this whole scene with the wine, I mean, his, his dad comes and starts giving him shit about it. Sure. Well, he ends up kind of, again, he ends up being a driving force behind that because the whole reason that this girl was raped is essentially as a party to Kareel's kind of, should I rape her? I don't know what I'm doing. And his right. father comes down and says, bus a bitch. Otherwise she's never going to be your baby. Another scene where you find him keeping up his cover, but at the same time, it turns out he's being really kind to Anna is that diner scene, which yeah. is just great. They go in there and they, the small family is now going to fight off the mafia. Um, it's the, what do we know about the mafia? Let's sit down. Let's go to a public place. They think they're being really smart and they order a burger and fries. I mean, Here's this this good, clean, I almost call them a good, clean American family, sitting around eating a burger and fries, and then the mobster walks in, and they're all uncomfortably sitting at what's the equivalent of a McDonald's booth, yeah. uh, talking about, I mean, who's... Whose court is the ball sure. in at this point? Right. What's the next move that they make? And then he sits down, calls out their tactics, yeah. asks for the diary, takes it, and leaves. Yeah, and then you think that he may have killed off uh, her uncle later on, but as the details about his cover are revealed, you find out that's not the case. Mm-hmm. All right, so I guess we talked about the most popular scene in Scanners. Mm-hmm. So uh, just as that scene is a great scene and yeah. it's the most popular scene, I think the most popular scene from Eastern Promises is probably also uh, an incredible scene. Well, and if you want to talk about where's Cronenberg in this film, yes, we kind yeah. of we've kind of been playing a little bit Cronenberg absenteeism when we're describing the film, but that's mm-hmm. because the film is really heavy. And there's a lot of Cronenberg in there. A lot of it's in the immersion. A lot of it's right. in the character development. And a lot of it's in the 
the subtext of what's going on with right. the plot. But if you want to see good old fashioned head blowing up Cronenberg <laughs> yeah. with a side of dick, yeah. you get to this bathhouse scene. Oh man. So, and this is also the scene I mentioned this to you as we were watching the movie, we we're five minutes in and I said, you know, I'm pretty sure this is a, uh, a mafia movie that does not have a single firearm in it. And so the whole movie, I'm, you know, trying to take notes, but also watching to see if there's a gun anywhere. Not a single gun. However, they do have these ridiculous knives. I think they look they're like used, raptor claws. Yeah, they're used to cut sheets of paneling or something, and they're used in the uh, in the bathhouse scene. That's the only time you really get a struggle with arms, with mm-hmm. some kind of weaponry. Although it's not guns, that would be a way different scene. Right. But that's where that good old Cronenberg awkwardness and tension and, and violence. of course violence Gratuitous and nudity. Violence. Yes. Yeah. So Viggo Mortensen's character is at his absolute most vulnerable because he has no fucking clothes and he has to fight off these two mobsters. But at the same time, uh, this is almost kind of a setup for these two guys. So he, you know, he's got a fight coming and man, they shoot this fight and it is, um, it doesn't hold anything back. It's incredibly graphic for both its violence and its nudity. You know, he's fighting these guys off and the camera's unapologetic. He's just all over the place. He's doing flips completely naked, just doing flips right. everywhere, boxing these guys out, Bleeding, fighting for his life. Open. Right. And you, uh, as a viewer, there's the shock factor of both, you know, it would be one thing if he were to just walk in a room and be naked and you go, oh, wow, that's Viggo Mortensen naked. Look at what this film's doing. But he's also fighting for his life sure. against these knives and hooks. So you just can't tear your eyes away from the screen. You're just, you're on the edge of your seat. What the fuck is going to happen to this guy? Uh, He doesn't have, you know, a jacket that can be torn through or some pants that can be torn through. You know, if that knife comes, yeah, if it comes anywhere near him, it is going to completely fuck him over. And it's just a bloody violent scene. And one that I think is extremely impressive. Great, It serves as the climax of the film. It's perfect for the film. It's this really interesting moment where, you kind of question whether or not he was set up or whether the mobsters were set yeah, up. Yeah. You wonder whether he was given the stars because they need somebody to fill in for Kareel yeah. so that they can wipe him out and right, not kill right. the kid. But maybe they kind of deep down knew that he was a fucking fighter and he yeah. wasn't going to go down. Yeah, and those stars, you know, we've neglected to talk about the tattoos at all, uh, mostly because I don't know anything about mob- mafia tattoos. Well, there's you know a really cool about? tattooing scene in the yes, film where, sure. where essentially the I'm guessing they're bo- they're mob heads, they're a bunch yeah. of the bosses, and they read him. Yeah. He kneels down and they read him, ask him for verification yeah. on his life, and then tell him to say he hates his parents. Yeah, well, he's sitting in that chair and then he stands up, and you see the the full tattoos. I mean, it's almost head to toe, covering his body, telling his story about. Uh, his prison sentences and you know what his life up to this point has meant and the other thing that serves especially your second time around is the the first time it's okay he went through prison and he's dedicated and all, all that stuff's really nice but then especially at the point where he gets the stars and he meets with his KGB handler or whatever his uh whatever the the fucking thing that replaced the KGB was well the Scotland Yard handler guy yeah and uh, and he says, you know, look, I've got the stars. You know, I'm in. Sure. And that's great because he's in. But it also makes you think he was he was almost fired from that job. Right. They almost pulled him off the job. He is covered head to toe in his undercover disguise. Those tattoos, they're not fucking coming off. Right. I mean, that's the end of his undercover work unless he chooses to do uh, or is assigned to do undercover work as that same character that you know he's playing uh-huh. there. So he has a lot invested in this, in you know, even in just his career. I mean, already it's a life or death scenario, which that's probably where really where the uh, where the stakes are and where all the danger is in that. But it's not like he's going to come back to the force or whatever, and then just get another undercover job and try and bust these guys some other way. Mm-hmm. He's going to wind up behind a fucking desk where he is going to have to cover all of his tattoos for the rest of for, his life. Yeah, for as long as he's an agent. Well, uh, even after he yeah, can't walk yeah. around Russia sure, with sure. with mob tattoos all over his body. So I think the tattoos are great in talking about who he is as a character, just being a, a very badass icon from the film. And then also having that very Cronenberg layered approach of here's what it means on the surface. But here's also this other thing that may sure. even say more. About well, I think that another implication about the tattoos is that maybe he's too into it. Yeah. That the, could be it. When yeah. it's when they're going to pull him and then they see the stars, 
his the Scotland Yard guy almost rolls his eyes and goes, yeah. oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe you should have checked back with us before you, uh, before he, you had that He done. kind of goes, check it out, I'm in. And the handler goes, no, bad move, man. <laughs> yeah, You right. are going to get yourself killed. And it's where you realize that maybe his dedication doesn't lie fully in either party. Maybe he's hoping to be the boss and reap that benefit in the same way that he's kind of undercover. Because he can, you know, he can collect two paychecks at that Yeah, point. but he ends up having to go for it because, I mean, once you're in, you've done so much work, you're so close. It's that point where you realize you could turn back, but again, stakes. The stakes are so fucking high now that he is in, now that he has the tattoos. Yeah, there's that moment that's an eye roll or, or excitement even as, hey, oh, hey, I didn't realize that mm-hmm. we finally made it that far. But you know that without those stars, he would have been out. That would have been it for him. He was a hair away from that, and he just managed to make it in. So this is the point, especially with all this stuff going on with the baby. I mean, they have to make their play right now. And you see that unfold, and then it ends on uh, what's another really iconic image of him sitting there as the boss, as having made it to the top of that ladder and not really knowing you know, what implications that has. Uh, sure. Where does the story go from there? I mean, it just, it opens up a whole nother can of worms. All right. So I guess we're Cronenberg out. We'll do the fly later. Yes, we certainly will. Okay. If you let us know what your favorite Cronenberg film is, let us know what we did wrong here. That's our favorite thing is we yeah. like when you tell us how bad we are. We don't get enough of that where it matters. We get that bullshit on episodes like the prestige where mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Sure. Um, yeah. If you know some stuff about Cronenberg that you don't think we hit on, I feel like we kind of got all the staples sure. here. But I'm certainly open. Neither of us have seen every single thing he's ever done. So uh, you think there's some big Cronenberg themes? Send those our way. Yeah, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You can also go to the website, which is doublefeatureshow.com. We have this iTunes thing where you can leave us reviews yeah. that come with stars. Um, like you can be the Russian mobster. No, don't be the Russian mobster. But you it's have dangerous. to leave us a review. Uh, other than that, I mean, what else? We have movies coming up next time. That's right, we do. We're going to do... Taken and P2. Taken, action kind of thing. And P- what is P2? P2 is this, it's a splat pack flick that takes place in a parking garage. Oh yeah, another kind of one place sort yep. of thing. God, and that Liam Neeson. Man, action all over the place to go from something right. like Eastern Promises right into a Liam Neeson movie. Our audience may be actioned out at that point. Fucking man up, pussies. Watch more fucking film. <laughs> Bye.